Welcome to This Week in Money. I'm Jim Goddard. Today, Chartwork CEO Ross Clark will take a look at the markets over the past week. The publisher of Bill Bonner's diary, Bill Bonner, explores whether the Dow will top 40,000, the impact of the new head of the U.S. Fed might have, and whether cryptocurrencies are a fad or here to stay. The editor of the Campbell Real Estate Timing Letter, Robert Campbell, says for the first time ever globally, real estate, stocks, and bonds are all going up together at the same time. He tells us why he believes that's happening. Plus, at the end of the show, we'll have company showcase updates from American Manganese CEO Larry Ray and Cascadero President Bill McWilliam. We'll talk to Ross Clark right after this. I'm Larry Ray, President and CEO of American Manganese, Inc., listed on the TSX Venture, ticker symbol AMY, A-M-Y, with proprietary patents in the U.S., China, and South Africa. Our focus is on recycling lithium-ion batteries for electric vehicles. China recently legislated the responsibility for recycling onto their electric vehicle manufacturers and importers. For more information, please visit AmericanManganeseInc.com or phone me, Larry Ray, at 778-574-4444. Welcome to This Week in Money, the source for market opinions. Here is Jim Goddard. My guest is Ross Clark. He's the CEO at Chartworks. Welcome back to This Week in Money, Ross. Good to be with you, Jim. Ross, what were the highlights for you in the markets this week? As we moved in through the week, you had uh, questions about the uh, new tax legislation in, in the U.S. and uh, saw credit spreads actually blow out quite a bit. The uh, uh, We look at... Uh, the uh, triple C bonds versus the governments that that widened by about 88 basis points, which is where you know it doesn't that number doesn't mean anything to people until you say, well, we went from eight and a quarter to to nine ten. So percentage wise, that's a pretty big move in the credit spreads. Um, and with that, the equity markets had their first decent sell off in months. I think you probably got to go back to April or May to see a correction like we had into the middle of this week. And um, got some good oversold readings on the high yield uh, um, bonds. The HYG rallied back uh, towards the end of the week, and that provided a bit of a bounce as far as the markets are concerned. But I think we need to keep an eye still on that high yield area of the marketplace because if this rally doesn't take hold, and uh, then I think that uh, you could be looking for more of a rolling top here in terms of the market. Um, we came close as far as the S&P was concerned midweek to getting some decent oversold readings, but not quite there. So one more sell-off towards the 50-day moving average, maybe a little bit under that, and uh, we'd be looking for, I think, a pretty reasonable buying area. Gold finally showing some life. Yeah, the tail end of the week, actually right there on Friday, uh, market came to life the second half of the day with a, a mildly U.S., uh, uh, weaker U.S. dollar. Nothing really to write home about there, but the gold and silver markets managed to, uh, close at their best levels in, uh, better than a month. Uh, the miners participated to a lesser degree, so once again, while the bullion is holding up well, and this has been going on for the better part of six or eight weeks now, uh, the miners are still having difficulty getting back to the September lows that they broke from. So while we're up into the mid-1290s on gold at this point, I think you're still going to have a lot of difficulty getting through the 1300, 13 and a quarter range. Um, still would like to see silver sell off relative to gold to put in a more significant bottom in the coming months and if we can start to see the miners showing a bit more resilience that would suggest that uh, we're closer to seeing uh, a kickoff to an upside move are speculators who would normally throw their money into precious metals now turning to cyber currencies like bitcoin well they are finding whatever moves and uh, you know with the action that we've had in the general equity markets which have been uh, in in the US side you've had these just continuous bull markets since 2009 with minor corrections in it but it's been pretty methodical um and on the Canadian side you've had some sector rotation to provide a little bit of excitement but the real movement has been over uh, as you say in the cyber area uh bitcoin ethereum uh the blockchain stocks and um we uh will be one of the things that I've looked at with clients over the years, and we've done uh, uh, a very good job of being able to identify excesses 
within these speculative markets, the type that I really couldn't um, talk about in general with people because of uh, where I was working, but the technicals work out very nicely when it comes to these very speculative markets. So um, anything in the Bitcoin area, anything in marijuana, uh, the lithiums and now the uraniums which are coming to life really lend themselves to the technical works that we do. So we'll be looking to put out a lot more in terms of recommendations, um, not just on the longer term, but more intermediate term in sort of that two-week to maybe six, eight-week uh, variety in terms of the, the moves that might be available there, looking for both the speculative moves to blow off on the upside and find the corrections where you can buy into these moves that look as though they may have gotten a little ahead of themselves. So, so the same technical rules that apply to traditional investments also apply to these hot commodities? Well, it, from a fundamental perspective, probably not, because most of them are still in the process of developing earnings. Most of them don't have anything to speak of, so you can't really look at P.E. ratios. You're looking at potentials moving forward. And, you know, when you get a new sector coming into play, there will be far more companies that fall by the wayside than make it big. So one will need to have a, a basket of items that they're involved with. And ideally, what we'd be looking for is spots that have reasonably low risk entry points where you're buying on corrections, or if you've got a big breakout on expanding volume coming out of a range, we'll look to buy a minor correction. And as always, um, with these speculative plays, you're going to have to have stop losses, whether they are physically in the market or mentally um, uh, established. You don't want to risk too much on any one play. Uh, and you just hope that uh, you manage to pick up a few that are uh, having the big moves. So uh, from our perspective, this is where you know there, there are going to be opportunities, uh, but one must be careful. Ross, for anybody curious about those markets, how can they get a hold of you? My email address is ross.clark at chartworks.ca. Ross, thanks a lot for being on This Week in Money. Good to be with you, Jim. My guest has been Ross Clark, CEO of Chartworks. Coming up, Bill Bonner, the editor and owner of Bonner & Partners Newsletter, next on This Week in Money. Always consult your investment professional before making any investment decision. Arctic Star Exploration, operated by a team of proven mine finders, is focused on diamonds in Finland and the Northwest Territories of Canada. A work program is planned for our Finland property that contains diamond-bearing kimberlite. Arctic Star trades on the TSX Venture Exchange, symbol ADD, and the Frankfurt Exchange, symbol 82A1. Please visit our website at arcticstar.ca or call us at 604-689-1799. I'm Brian Fowler, President of Blind Creek Resources Limited, listed on the TSX Venture Exchange, ticker symbol BCK. Blind Creek is focused in the Yukon, Northwest Territories, and British Columbia. The company's key property is the Blend Project, one of the largest undeveloped lead-zinc silver deposits in Western Canada, plus plans to advance the recently acquired, fully permitted historic engineer gold mine in the Atlant District of Northwestern BC. Check us out at blindcreekresources.com. This Week in Money is archived online at talkdigitalnetwork.com. Welcome back to This Week in Money. I'm Jim Goddard. We're speaking with Bill Bonner. He's an author, the founder of Agora Incorporated, and writes Bill Bonner's Diary, available for free at bonnerandpartners.com. He's speaking to us from Baltimore. Bill, welcome back to This Week in Money. Well, thank you, Jim. It's good to be back. Bill, what is Crack Up Boom, and are we experiencing one now? Well, uh, no, I don't think so. We're, we, it, it kind of feels like it, but, but we're not really in a boom. You know, there are a lot of signals and there are a lot of mixed signals and a lot of things that are happening that are, appear to be good and things that appear to be bad. But the crack up boom is a term that the economist Ludwig von Mises came up with to describe what happens when the Fed or the central banks go all out in printing money or in our case, creating money by credit. And we haven't seen that yet. I think we will see it, but we, we haven't quite gotten there yet. 
what do you think would be the signal that were there? Oh, I don't think there'll be any doubt when it happens. But what, in order to get there, you have to get to a point where the central authorities have less to fear by ramping up the economy in sort of a chaotic and wild way than they fear by doing nothing or by letting uh, letting interest rates rise or letting stocks fall. You know, they are totally committed to... Uh, to this system of backing up the stock market, you know that they believe that the stock market has to go up, and it was uh, it was um, Alan Greenspan who started that in 1987, and so you know they're committed to this. They can't let the stock market fall and stay down and not do anything because it it would usher in for sure a serious recession and probably a depression. So what they're going to do, I think, well, first of all, you have to. Remember, the markets go up and they go down, and people forget that because they've been going up for so long. People forget that they also go down, but they do go down, and they go down for a lot of reasons, and sometimes you don't know what the reason is. But this market is well overdue to go down, and when it does, you're going to see a lot of panic reactions, and the panic reactions are going to lead to kind of a Japan-style program where they are buying bonds just like they did the last time in the QE program and probably a lot more they're probably going to drive interest rates into negative territory and they're probably going to buy stocks too and in China by the way China's economy its financial structure is so dependent on real estate that the Chinese government is actually buying apartments so we're going to see a huge boom up in this kind of thing and when that happens I think then we'll see the what uh, Mises called the crack-up boom. We've heard predictions the Dow might hit 40,000. What do you think? Well, I think that's quite possible. I don't think it'll hit 30,000 easily, uh, or 40,000 easily. I mean, right now it's a 23. I think you'll you know, it's already way overpriced. So my guess is that sometime, maybe even before the end of this year, but uh, probably next year you're going to see a crash. And when the crash happens, the market will probably go down to around 10000 And uh, you're going to see a one hell of a panicky situation. And then after that, when there's inflation, you need real inflation to get going in order to get up to 40000 Gold and silver continue to trade within a range. What do you see ahead for gold and silver? Well, I, I think they, too, are captive in this. I mean, I think everything right now is just holding fire. It's all in suspension. We have an economy that uh, the economy itself is not doing well. There has been no real recovery. The economy is holding on. But the, the assets have gone up generally because the central banks have been pumping in money. And we know that the U.S. stopped pumping in money about two years ago. But the other nations didn't. And we have England, we have Europe. It says that Mario Draghi's been at it at a rate of about $60 billion a month for the last five years. I mean, he's still going full, full, full bore. The, the Japanese are still going at it. And China, by the way, had a real spree over the last six months or year because they were, they were, had, had a political situation in which the, uh, the, the chairman wanted to be crowned as the great leader of uh, China. And so he did not want the economy to be in, in, a, in a downturn when they had their party congress, which happened about a month ago, I think. And so we ha- we've gotten to the end of all these things now. All, these, all this input, all this stimulus that's been happening is coming to an end. Would war in the Middle East cause the price of oil to explode and thus end up being financially beneficial to the Middle East? Well, it's hard to know. Now, the Middle East is not uh, doesn't have the grip on the oil market that it once had because so much oil comes from the U.S. But uh, certainly, any cutoff in supplies depends on how severe it was, depends on where it was. You know, would the Straits of Hormuz be closed? You know, there's so many un- unknowns, known unknowns, and completely unknown unknowns <laughs> that you really. There's no way to say, but certainly any any activity, any war like that is bound to shoot up the price of, price of oil. Has China's credit boom caused the world to be flooded with debt from China? Uh, well, uh, well, there's certainly a lot of Chinese debt around, but it's mostly in China. It's not 
not flooded around the world. Most of it is in China, and uh, and that, that situation is something that I don't think is well understood or appreciated, is the fact that there's so much of it. You know, the Chinese just have a tremendous amount of debt. As I told you, you know, in order to keep that debt uh, alive, you know, they're buying apartments because so much of that debt is tied to their internal real estate market. So uh, I think that's a huge, huge, you know, as, as we always say, we never know what or when will cause a crash. But that's one of the things that could. The Chinese are just so heavy, heavily in debt, so deep in debt that if something goes wrong, who knows what would t- set it off, but they could have a real crisis there. I've asked our Asian correspondent how China plans to deal with their debt, and he says their plan right now is just print more money. Is that a solution? Yeah, I think, yeah, that's the plan for just about everybody. Are central banks starting to constrict credit? Yes, they, they are now. Um, they, uh, you know, famously, the U.S. has said it's going to return to normalcy, and it started last month. And with a ten billion dollar uh, cutback, you know, in the in the Fed assets, so they do that by just letting their letting the debt that they hold expire. So, uh, yeah. So there, so that's what's happening, and it's happening. It started in the U.S. and recently, Mario Draghi said he's cutting back, and the Chinese are cutting back because they they know they've gone too far and they don't need to go any further right now for political reasons, and the Japanese are the only ones who are still at it full bore. And the Japanese, you know, who knows what that's going to do, but that's not big enough to sustain the whole world economy. So, yes, they're cutting back. And this means that the, 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 the buy, the buy, the bid that's been under the whole debt market and some of the stock market uh, is, is going away. It's turning into a, you know, a sell. So this is, this is big. I, I don't think it's as big as many people think because I don't think they'll stick with it. But it certainly is a big change. Are real estate bubbles around the world in jeopardy? And I know I'm living in a city, Vancouver, that's probably right at the very edge of that bubble. I think Vancouver is right on the top of that bubble because it it suffers from the bubble in real estate prices in Canada as well as the bubble in, in credit in China. You know, those people buying apartments in Vancouver, a lot of them are Chinese and a lot of them have uh, financial situations in China that depend upon debt. So, yes, I, I would say Vancouver is a risky proposition right now, and it's not the only one in London, too. And uh, I'm not familiar with many bubbles. I'm here in Baltimore, by the way, and Baltimore hasn't had a real estate bubble since uh, about 1927. <laughs> so uh, I'm, I'm not so familiar with real estate bubbles. Throughout history, are there any examples of debt bubbles that did not eventually burst? Uh, none that I know of. I mean, debt, as somebody once put it, debt has to be paid. It's either paid by the borrower or the lender or the general public. And there's no, I mean, that's just the way it is. I can't see that you could have a debt bubble without a resolution of some sort of debt crisis. I don't know when that's ever happened. Is debt slavery the new politically correct form of slavery? Well, uh, yes. I mean, it not only is it politically correct, it's the kind that the political class would like to expand. Because when you're a debt slave, you just don't have much choice. And that's the way it's going. And I, to me, this is the, the, the dangerous and the, the part of the trend that I like the least. Because when you have so many people, they don't now, you know, young people, they come out of college with, with student debt. And because they have student debt, they can't really ever accumulate much assets. And so they, they don't buy a car. They get a car on credit and they get a house on credit and they use credit cards. In fact, I just went into my shop to buy a cup of coffee and I didn't have anything other than a $50 bill. And they wouldn't take the $50 bill. They said, Oh, we don't take anything larger than a 20. So what it means is you're just more and more forced to use credit. So I use my credit card to pay for a coffee, which seemed crazy. But that's the way it's, it's working. And, and all over the world, governments are, are cracking down on cash. In the U.S., they confiscate it whenever they get their hands on it. You drive down the wrong road, and they stop your car and take your cash and use it to buy a buy an armored vehicle for the police department. And uh, elsewhere in France, you know, you can't do a transaction. I think it's a $1,000 cash limit on a transaction. But all over the world, they're trying to eliminate cash 
drive everybody into the banking system, into the credit system, and make sure everybody is fully mortgaged up. We'll have more with Bill Bonner next on This Week in Money. I'm Bill McWilliam, president of Cascadero Copper, CCD on the TSX Venture Exchange. Cesium is one of the world's rarest metals with a growing industrial demand. Drilling is underway on our Tehran property in Argentina to prove up a cesium resource. Cascadero's patent-pending leach process has the potential to make Cascadero the lowest-cost supplier of cesium in the world. Visit our website, cascadero.com, or phone us at 604-924-5504. Glance Technologies owns and operates Glance Pay, a disruptive mobile payment technology now live in 16 cities in Canada and about to launch in the U.S. With revenues up 664% in the last quarter, Glance Technologies has the potential to be a worldwide leader in an industry projected to grow to $1.3 trillion in three years. Glance Technologies stock symbols are GLNFF in the U.S. and GET in Canada. Find out more at glancepay.com. Lotus Ventures Inc. is a BC-based medical marijuana company poised to launch into the rapidly evolving cannabis sector. Lotus is in the final review stage of the Health Canada approvals to become a licensed producer, having arranged facility financing of up to $12 million, plus building permits for its prototype indoor production facility. Shares trade under the symbol J on the Canadian Securities Exchange. Visit our website at lotusventures.ca. This Week in Money is archived online at talkdigitalnetwork.com. Welcome back to This Week in Money. I'm Jim Goddard. We're speaking with Bill Bonner, founder of Agora Incorporated and the writer of Bill Bonner's Diary, which you can find online for free at bonnerandpartners.com. Bill, what's your outlook for the U.S. dollar? Well, I think that in the short run, the dollar is strong. The dollar is strong because the Fed is beginning its program of anti QE. They are, uh, you know, taking away their, their assets. They're letting them expire. And that program now is going with very, very little baby steps, but they're committed, at least publicly committed, to a program in which, uh, by this time next year, they'll be offloading about $600 billion a year, which is a substantial amount. So instead of flooding the country with more money and credit they're going to be taking away that money and credit and that's going to mean a stronger dollar interest rates should go up we should see people capital from around the world coming into the u.s what is the new chair of the federal reserve jerome powell likely to do he he is he's not just likely he is sure to continue the policy he's been there now for many years he has never voted against the majority He has never resisted any program of stimulus, QE, or otherwise. He has grown up in Washington, D.C. He went to the same law school I went to, Georgetown, which is a law school specializing in government law. So uh, I don't see any. He's an insider, pure, 100%. He's a deep stater. He has worked for the big banks. He's worked in the Treasury Department. He is gone through the revolving door so many times, the hinges have practically come off. So he, no, he's going to do totally what's expected. Predictions. What do you see ahead for 2018? Oh, 20, I don't make predictions. I don't really have any idea. I, I feel like it's, we're going to see some more volatility simply because volatility has been so low. And we have such a dangerous mix of politics and economics and finance. And I can't believe there won't be some sort of major crisis, either political or economic, most likely both. So, uh, you know, I would, uh, my advice to everybody is, you know, you don't know what the future is going to predict, what the future is going to produce, but I would want to be careful. Would the world economy be better off without free trade agreements? Well, yeah, yeah, well it, it would be better off without free trade agreements if it also had free trade. You know, the free trade agreements are sometimes better than nothing because countries always want to manage their trade. and They have so many internal lobbies that want them to stop people from importing wool or stop them from importing, you know, steel or whatever it is. Everybody's got something, got some angle, got some some uh, fruit to, to eat there. So 
you need to, uh, these free trade agreements, anyway, the trade agreements sometimes codify, they make things simpler in a way, they tend to be much too complex. The world would be better without them, but it would not be better without free trade. I mean, what we really should have is free trade, which is scrap these trade agreements and just announce that we will trade with everybody on whatever terms we can get. We don't need any trade agreements. So you agree sh- countries should be free to openly trade with one another and not worry ab- about what somebody else thinks about the deal? Oh, absolutely. But you have to. You need free trade to make that work. You need to just announce in the face of all your internal uh, lobbyists who are trying to stop it, you need to announce that, uh, you know, we'll trade with anybody. We don't care what who you are or what you're doing. And, and then they, they come up with these things like the foreigners are subsidizing their exports. And then you've got to argue about whether the price of labor is a subsidy, the fact that they allow workers to smoke on the job. Is that some kind of subsidy? Is that, are they, you know, what's, what kind of thing is that? And so, but you just have to say, say enough of all that. You know, we're going for free trade. We want to trade openly and freely with everybody. Do you see any positives ahead for the Canadian economy? Uh, well, again, I don't follow the Canadian economy. I mean, it's got this huge, leveraged real estate sector that I would be very worried about. On the other hand, uh, you know, C- Canadians generally are, are, are calmer and more conservative than Americans. So they, so they never seem to suffer as much or benefit as much from the world trends. Is the European Union doomed? Doomed? Hmm, I don't know. I don't, I don't agree with a lot of people who think it's doomed because it's a European Union and those people speak all kinds of different languages. I don't think it works that way. Uh, but I think that uh, there's a lot of, there are a lot of groups and I think the thing going on in Spain with Catalonia is one of the most important and most interesting thing that's going on because what's happening is that the, the, the group, the grouping the, the European Union cannot hold together when you have all these little groups trying to get away from it. You can keep big countries together, you know, like Germany, the Germany and the, uh, and France and uh, Spain, uh, they w- are in there because their leaders benefit from it. They know that they can lose an election in, 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 in the Loire Valley and go on to become a minister of something or other in, in Belgium. I mean, it's all kind of wacky. But uh, do I think it's going to fall apart? I don't know. I think definitely the Europe, Europe benefits from having a kind of uh, international trade, free trade, free movement uh, treaty. That part of it works. The, the details, when they get into trying to regulate, as they always do, you know, they try to regulate what, what goes into a sausage and how, how many ounces you have to put into your uh, Coca-Cola. Then, you know, things fall apart and it gets to be cumbersome. And I know though, the, I live much of the year in France actually, and, uh, you know, the, the, the agricultural restrictions are amazing, amazingly complex. And the farmers live not by the weather, but by these rules and regulations coming out of Brussels. So those things are, are definitely a cost. And I think that smaller places that don't get much out of it politically, are seeing their opportunity, and we're going to see a lot more of that. And it's going to be a big stress on the whole system, and how it will turn out, I don't know. Has the recent massive immigration into Europe changed that place for the foreseeable future? Well, certainly it has, and it's changed it in lots of different ways, and you're seeing a lot of reaction to immigration. I was recently in uh, in uh, Cologne in um, Germany, and I was kind of shocked. Because you, in one area, it's very German, as you'd expect, orderly, uh, or, uh, clean, <laughs> everything. Uh, but then you, I crossed over the railroad tracks, and on the other side, literally over the railroad tracks, on the other side, all the shops, there were a lot of them, had their signs in Arabic. And I realized, boy, that is a big community, and it was big, uh, big part of the city was actually these, uh, what you know, to us were kind of shocking, uh, foreigners. So I think certainly there's a reaction to that in Europe, whether it's a, whether it matters to me, you know, it's very nice if you can go into and go into a nice Moroccan restaurant in, in, uh, in Germany, but, but I'm not German and, and the Germans are reacting in, in kind of a nativist way and you'd expect that and who knows what kind of restrictions they're going to throw up and how is that going to affect Europe and nobody knows, but certainly there's going to be a big 
there are big changes afoot. Is George Soros a brilliant investor, even though he creates havoc to make big profits? Well, certainly, uh, you know, I can't argue with the fact that he is a successful investor. Is he brilliant? I don't know. I read his book. I thought it was, I thought it was clever. Uh, brilliant? I don't know. You know, all these reputations hang on performance, and all performance hangs on things that the performer has no real control over. If you look at Warren Buffett's record, for example, it's spectacular, but it also takes place over a period in which the stock market uh, performed better than ever in history. So, you, you, you know, these things all go together, and I think the, the reputations all tend to be re-revised and reappraised after the facts change. Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies, are they the modern-day version of tulips? Well, no, I don't think so. Uh, they're much more clever and nuanced than tulips. Tulips, you know, that was a, certainly an interesting, interesting bubble. And, uh, I think to, the, uh, cryptos are in a bubble, but I don't think they're only in a bubble because I think people are reacting to the fact that the money isn't any good. The worldwide money is based upon the dollar and the dollar is based on nothing but the goodwill and foresight of American politicians and bankers, and I tell you, and I don't think there's much of that. So, I think that people there, there's a fundamental need, and Bitcoin seems to be rising to try to fill it. Will it succeed? I don't know. Is it legit? I don't know. Can they really limit the number of Bitcoin? I mean, if somebody came along tomorrow and told me, "Well, hey, some guys figure out a way to make twice as many Bitcoin," I would believe them. I don't have any reason not to believe them. So I don't know. I don't know. You know, money is a funny thing, and I've been studying it for a long time. Money works when it works. It doesn't work because somebody says it works. It works when it works. Gold works because it, 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 it embodies a thousand years or two thousand or four thousand years of human experience where we come to realize that it works. Now, we don't have that same experience with Bitcoin, so it's just starting up. And we know, we think we know, or I think I know, that theoretically it ought to work. But that's a, there's a big difference between a theoretical ought to work and a real thousand year experience. So we have a tradition in gold. We have no tradition in Bitcoin. All we have is a theory. And I think that theory is fascinating. And I think I encourage everybody to get out and buy a Bitcoin or maybe just a piece of a Bitcoin now because they're so expensive. But it's fascinating to see what's going on and to try to understand it. And I do encourage people to do that, even though I, I, I say, you know, it could disappear tomorrow. What does Big Brother hope to achieve through data collection and the surveillance state? Well, the Big Brother is uh, 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 is the state, the insiders who control the state, and uh, I'm not sure specifically what they want to achieve, but I see coming a world in which we are all controlled by money because the government, for the first time, I think, has the power to get control of money and to use data to determine whom to reward and whom to punish. And they're already doing this in China. They're experimenting with this thing called the citizen score. And what they do is they can keep track of everything you do. If you get a, a parking ticket, for example, it goes into your citizen score. Or, And I can imagine going much further because now you know how they have these these very uh, strange and, and, and brutal uh things having to do with what you can say and what you can not say. Well, now I can perfectly well imagine that if you go on the wrong website, your citizen score will be will be hurt. You'll get subtracted. And then the citizen score will be applied to, say, your mortgage rate or could be your tax rate. There's no reason, you know, there's a lot of innovation coming up. And one of the things that I've imagined deep at late at night, you know, <laughs> was that they could fairly well devise a citizen score because they know exactly what you're doing all the time. And with a citizen score, they could apply that to your earnings directly so that what you get is what, what you earned after your citizen score adjusted tax rate has been applied. So you could pay a lot or a little depending on what, whether they liked you. And they, it would all sound so reasonable when you put it out in front of people. The citizen score rewards good citizens. And why shouldn't it? But, uh, that, that, that does a kind of, uh, scare me late at night. And, uh, I think it probably should scare others. 
Can a divided America become a united America? No, I think that day is past. I think uh, just like Europe. Now, America is much more naturally united because everybody speaks more or less the same language. But uh, it's not really united. And it's always been a bit of a uh, artificial country. Uh, Americans are, you know, all these people coming together in the melting pot and they become Americans. Well, kind of they become Americans, but there's a big gap between, uh, somebody who lives, uh, in the best section of Boston and somebody who lives in the worst section of New York. Uh, and these are very different people with very different goals. And, uh, I think we're going, we're seeing already these kind of breakups in the states, you know, the people, People in the blue states and the red states and the South Virginia, North Virginia. So it wouldn't surprise me at all if we have the same kind of, uh, it's a long-term thing. It's not going to happen tomorrow, but we could have the same sort of, uh, of division, the same sort of, uh, uh, centripetal force that sort of pulls people apart. And, uh, and I, I can't see it yet, but it'd be kind of interesting or kind of fun to see Texas secede, for example, see what would happen. Yeah, I've heard there are polls that say about 38% of Texans would like to be their own country. <laughs> yeah, I think they're exaggerating, but it's possible. One year after the election, your thoughts on the Trump presidency? Oh, my. Oh, my. I've gotten so much uh, bad uh, bad feedback from readers. Because uh, initially, I was skeptical of Trump. You, know, you listen to him talk, you think, what is this guy? And, and his positions are very incoherent in a lot of ways. They're not not classic Republican positions, certainly not classic conservative positions. They're kind of all over the place, and some of them don't make any sense at all. So still, when he got into into got the election, I think I, I and a lot of people were sort of pleased just to see what he would do. And now we see what he'll do, and what he'll do is pretty much what they all do, and that is that he quickly joined forces with the deep state insiders, and that was done almost immediately with the Wall Street he brought in. Uh, Cohn and uh, Newton, and then uh, days later he had his generals, so he had the military industrial complex and the Wall Street monetary complex all there right from the get-go, and uh, then the uh, Obamacare was not repealed, there was no cutback either in the social welfare spending or in the military spending, so it's pretty much, and then he put in this guy Jerome Powell, and that was probably the final nail in the coffin of conservatism. Powell is a complete deep state uh, apparatchik. So that so we see fully all the elements of the deep state that existed before he elected was elected are still there, more powerful than ever, and more powerful than ever partly because he's there, because he represents the opposition so that people who are sort of naturally suspicious, cynical, and opposed to this establishment insiders, they think, many of them, that they have a champion in Washington who is on their side, who's fighting for them, who's trying to reduce the impact, the effect, the influence of these deep staters. And in fact, Trump is not at all. He is right there with them. He is enabling them. And I think we're going to see pretty much the same program we would have seen with Hillary Clinton. Does the release of the JFK files by Trump expose the workings of the deep state? Well, uh, yes and no. He didn't expose much of them. He quickly, Trump said he was going to put them out, and then somebody in the CIA or somewhere got his ear, and he didn't. <laughs> and I think the fact that he didn't was very telling because somebody obviously told him, no, you can't release those because it shows who we are and what we're doing. There is no security reason not to release them. This is over half a century ago these things took place. There's nothing, there's no agents in the field who would be exposed. Instead, what it is, is what they don't want to expose is the fact that they are just incompetent and they're corrupt and they do things that they shouldn't do. And uh, and some of that did come out. It, it was, it already come out and it had to do with, uh, what was it? They were, they were oh, the plan to sink a, a boat with Cuban refugees and then blame it on Castro. <laughs> I mean, only nutcase people would do something like that but these that's what they are and they didn't want that to come out or people talking too much about it or you know it, it, it it's not the part of the a part of the myth that they want exposed 
How can people separate propaganda from truth? Well, I mean, it's almost impossible. I mean, that's a, that's a problem with the news, the fake news. Almost all the news is fake news in the sense that you've got to decipher it. It doesn't mean somebody is intentionally telling you something that's wrong. I mean, even Trump, he's accused of lying all the time, but I don't think he really intends to lie. Just for him, the truth has kind of a flexible meaning. And I think that's true in our in our brave new world, too, where there's so much truth flying around because the Internet's so many, full of so many facts and innuendos. We don't know. I mean, it, and it's very hard to know what the truth is. And I, I, don't, I don't think I would worry about it too much because you're, not, you're never going to know what the truth is. And when you, if you dug into it, you'd find the truth is rather nuanced, as it always is. Right now, we have all these claims going back 50 years or 20 years. Uh, women are coming forward and say, so-and-so pinched my bottom, you know, when I was 16. And are they true? Well, my guess is, yeah, they are true. But true in what sense? I mean, why didn't they come forward earlier? What, what was going on? It was a different world then. And people did things that they wouldn't do now and regret now and so on. And, and now we judge people by saying, by standards that are standards today, but weren't standards then. So the truth is like the truth always is. It's kind of infinitely complex. And you're not going to get the truth by tuning into a particular radio station or something. It doesn't work that way. They're all, they're all, every news media, every opinion is always laden with its own kind of prejudices, its own kind of, uh, of ideas. So, so it's just not that simple. Are the Clintons too big to prosecute? Uh, well, I don't know. I mean, we'll probably find an answer to that. But, uh, you know, th this is typical of degenerate societies, degenerate politics, where if you get into power immediately, you want to punish the people who opposed you. Partly you want to do that so they can't oppose you to, again. Partly you just want to punish them. And uh, they, they, did, they do that, did it. I say did it, but they don't do it so much anymore. But in Latin America and Argentina, if you won the election, if you lost the election, you better get out of town because they were going to come after you, and they would come after you using the government that they just got control of. And so we're seeing that now in Washington and how far it will go. You know, it's rather the idea is still, I think, rather shocking and abhorrent to a lot of people, so we don't know how far it will go. But uh, it certainly is a move towards a degenerate democracy. Are President Trump's successful meetings with world leaders a positive step for geopolitics? Mm, probably not. I, I don't think their meetings were successful. You're talking about the Asian tour. Yeah. Were they successful? I don't know. Probably not. They're probably just a show fest. You know, the, the local leader needs to show that he's connected to the global leader, and the global leader needs to show that he's on top of his game, and I don't think any of it matters at all. Uh, I think that other things are going on, and these people, these guys are opportunists, and they will use these things for whatever gain they can get out of them. What makes people want to control other people? Gosh, that's a complex <laughs> philosophical <laughs> kind of question, but I think they always have and uh, always will because it's the easiest way to get what you want. You know, and we were born and raised, I believe I was talking about the human species, was developed in a period in which getting what you wanted meant, it meant either you went out up a tree and got a banana or something, or you got somebody and got something from that person because there was no, there was no, no opportunity for the kind of capitalist gain that we can get now. If you invent something today, you can make a lot of money. If you start a new chain of restaurants or you figure out a new algorithm for the internet, you can make a lot of money by actually increasing the world's wealth. There was no opportunity for that during most of mankind's uh, development period. So it's not in our genes. And instead, in our genes is the desire to control other people, to manipulate them, to get them to do what we want, and, uh, and, and unfortunately, to kill them if they don't. So uh, those, those instincts are pretty deep, and I don't think they're going away. Should we be excited or alarmed by artificial intelligence? Uh, I think we probably should be neither. I, 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 I was actually writing about that yesterday, and uh, I think it's mostly nonsense. I don't think there is any real artificial intelligence. There's barely any other kind of intelligence. And, and if there were artificial intelligence coming along and the, you had a computer that was much smarter than you were, and it, it, it said something to you, 
say, for example, you said, hey, hey, computer, who, uh, who, I should vote for whom in the next election? And then the computer said, you should vote for so by somebody, Hillary Clinton. And you say, well, F you. <laughs> I'm not going to vote for Hillary Clinton. You know, you don't know. Just because the computer is smart, there are a lot of people who are smarter than I am, but that doesn't mean I want to listen to them. It doesn't mean that they do things better than I do them or or better than I would want them to, to do them. You know, if you had a computer, a person who's staying in your house and he's smarter than you are, and you say, well, what kind of toothpaste should I use? And you don't care what the answer is. It doesn't matter because most of, most of what we do as human beings is, is barely related to intelligence at all. And any kind of artificial intelligence is not going to have any effect on us. I, I, I predict that it'll, it's a total bomb as a technology. Do you see significant growth ahead for electric vehicles? Yeah, I think they, they're, they're coming along. They're, I, I'm not a techno, technical person, but I see more and more cars that are electrical, partly electrical. And my son bought a Tesla, and I thought it was pretty cool because it's very quiet and accelerates very fast. And uh, I don't know exactly what the cost differentials are, but I assume the electrical vehicles will get more, get cheaper and better, and I think people will want them. How can people find out more about Bill Bonner's diary? Well, it's uh, we're on naturally on the internet that uh, Bonner and Partners, Bill Bonner's diary. Just uh, check it out. It's free, by the way. It's a bargain. <laughs> Bill, thank you so much for being on this week in money. Well, thank you. It's always fun. My guest has been Bill Bonner. He's an author, the founder of Agora Incorporated, and writes Bill Bonner's Diary, which is available for free at bonnerandpartners.com. Coming up, the publisher of the Campbell Real Estate Timing Letter, Robert Campbell, next on This Week in Money. Hi, I'm Douglas Mason, President and CEO of Magnum Gold Corp, Inc., MGI on the TSX Venture Exchange. A 2015 drill program on the LH property intersected high-grade gold, including 16.9 meters of 13.58 grams and 11 meters of 20.66 grams per ton gold. A follow-up drill program is planned to further evaluate previously identified subsurface high-grade gold mineralization. Please visit our website at magnumgoldcorp.com. Hi, I'm Douglas Mason, President and CEO of Rainy Mountain Royalty Corp, RMO on the TSX Venture Exchange. Rainy Mountain's Brunswick property is located in the Ridout Shear Zone in Ontario, with grab samples running as high as 32 grams per ton gold. A follow-up drill program to test the numerous targets located by recent groundwork will commence later this year. Please visit our website at rmroyalty.com. Avon Resources Limited is a gold exploration company with significant projects in British Columbia, Saskatchewan, and the Yukon. Trading on the TSX Venture Exchange, symbol ABN, and the pink symbol ABN AF. Surrounded by world-class gold deposits and mines, Avon's 23,000 hectares Forest Kerr Gold Project is located in the heart of the Golden Triangle in northwestern BC. For more information, visit us at avonresources.com. This Week in Money is archived online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. My guest is Robert Campbell. He's the editor of the Real Estate Timing Letter at RealEstateTiming.com. Welcome back to the show, Robert. Thank you very much. I'm happy to be here. Bob, you've got a couple of big speeches coming up in San Diego. What are you going to be telling the folks there? Yes, the um, I'm glad we're on this topic Jim, because you know what's happening in 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 real estate right now in the United States, and um, uh, especially in in the western part of the state, in, in states like California or in cities in California, Seattle, Portland, Las Vegas, we are really experiencing right now a um, a long lasting real estate boom, and and housing prices, even though they're not going up gangbusters, the year over year gain. Keeps, has been increasing for the last two straight years, almost three years, Jim. So in other words, that, you know, prices to the upside are picking up momentum now in the United States. They're not, they're not falling off even from these super high levels. And what, you know, my advice so that, that I tell people that here's my strategy. Here's my strategy. If you go back in California, for example, or the state of California, look the last 40 years, 
that, you know, that's a boom and bust state. 45% of the time of those 45 years, for 19 of those 40 years, California was recovering from uh, previous real estate losses. So my strategy for investing in real estate is only to, inv only to invest during the rising, you know, the periods when price expectations um, uh, favor, you know, uh, price appreciation. And during other times, you sell, you get out, you take your, you, you pay your tax, and uh, now you have a lot of cash either to invest in alternative, alternative investments that may be doing well, but the key is to, is to be looking again for when that real estate cycle, you know, when prices come down and the cycle hits the bottom, to buy back in. Because that, to me, is by, by far, by far, the most profitable way to invest in real estate, even if you have to pay taxes on the, taxes on the gains. It's to buy when prices are low, just like Warren Buffett tells you to do, Jim. Buy when housing prices are, any asset prices are low, and then sell when they're high, or, or if you wanna, if you wanna hold another cycle or two like Buffett, that's fine. But if you only wanna hold through one like 10 year, full 10 year cycle, buy when they're low, and sell six or seven or years later when they're high, hold the cash, and then buy back when they're low again. That's how you manage risk, and that's where the big money's made in real estate, Jim. It's made in price appreciation. It's not made in cash flow. I knew that a long time ago. So that's, that's, that's the message I'm giving my people down here right now. Because I've seen it so many times. People ride the cycle up and ride the cycle up, you know, and all of a sudden greed takes over, and all of a sudden they ride the cycle back down. So 11 years after the peak in 2006, we're finally back to break even here in, in housing prices in San Diego, California. And I know people that bought late in the cycle, and they, they have a sigh of relief right now that they, they've got their money back. They've got their money back. And I'm wondering, I wonder if they'll make the same mistake again. And I asked a real smart friend of mine, and he goes, oh, they will. <laughs> Nobody will sell again at the peak. They'll ride it back down again. So it's just fascinating that the cycles, you know, that, that real estate is, is cyclical all over the world, Canada, you know, Australia, United States, Europe, anywhere, that you just don't play the cycles. And the only time you invest is when price appreciation is expected. And if there's key, and there, there are key indicators that you can follow, you know, because you need to have a, a reasonably accurate method for gauging real estate trends and I show people how to do that and it's not a bunch of it's not a bunch of voodoo magic or anything it's been proven so that's the key so we're going to ride this trend we're going to keep riding this riding this horse in the direction it's going until it wants to change directions that's my advice to real estate investors Robert have you ever seen a time though where globally everything is going up at the same time real estate the stock market bonds never I, not my not my 70 years here on earth, and I doubt it. And that's what it is. And you have to wonder about this. You say, okay, what has happened in the last 20 years? And you know what's happened? Is central banks have taken over the world, Jim, and they've they've just saturated it with money and credit. And that's and this money's looking for a home, and that's where it's going into. It's going into asset values. Is this a good or bad thing? It's good if you know how to play the trends. It's bad if you don't. Because what the Federal Reserve is trying to do is they're trying to eliminate the business cycle, right? The boom bust cycle. You know, we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna prevent it from getting too hot and, you know, and, and we're not gonna let it get too cold either. And the irony of it is, is what they've done is they made the cycles more extreme. So the very thing they're trying to prevent, they're going to cause. Precisely. Somebody's just and that they have caused. I mean, since 2000, we've had two stock market crashes. That, that uh, U.S. stock market crashes. I think uh, S and P down, you know, uh, a little over 40 percent one year, and, and a little over 50 percent the next year. Those are typically rare. You don't see those things happening. And look where the markets are today. You know, the U.S. stock market is is you know it's well above its record highs, way above. U.S. housing prices are above their record highs. Everything's above their old their old. Um, bubble highs from, you know, right before the, the crisis started the last time. So history does repeat. You know, Charlie Munger, Charlie Munger, you know who Charlie Munger is, don't you? Yep. Yep. He was teaching in a, a college investment class a couple years ago. One kid asked him, said, Mr. Munger, if there is one thing and one thing only you would tell me to do so that I would be a better investor, what would it be? Charlie said three things. Study history, study history, study history. <laughs> 
and, and those who don't are doomed to repeat it, aren't they? Absolutely. That's 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 the bet to make, right? If you don't study history, you're going to keep making the same stupid mistakes over and over and over. History does repeat itself. There's a cycle to life. You know, nothing goes straight up, nothing goes straight down. And, um, you know, that's why Charles Darwin said, he said, the most successful people in the world, you know, are not the smartest or are not the bravest. They're the people that, that have most successfully adjusted to change over time. And that's, that's the game. With uh, everything going up right now, when do you feel that these things are going to peak and maybe people should be looking to take some cash out of their investment and then buy when things are lower? In interestingly, you know, the cycles have become more volatile. And for instance, in the stock market, if you look at the, the, the stock market, when the stock market crashed 50%, starting in 08 to 09, that crash occurred really quickly. Even the trend followers like myself, didn't get a good chance to get out because the time that, you know, the data took you out, two or three months later, the market was already down two-thirds of the way before it hit bottom. And that could happen in real estate, too. So that's a very subjective call. Very subjective, Jim. I mean, I just, you know what? I just think this thing is the, I mean, there's no telling. I mean, I, I think the, and, and most of the rich people have the money. You know, they're the ones with the money. And, and even though that, you know, they can't keep things from falling, I think they're going to keep their, you know, their pedal to the metal on this. They're going to keep, they're going to keep, you know, printing money and whatever it takes, you know, to finance deficits, to finance spending, to give money to people, to keep this thing inflated. But the next, the next downturn, I think when it occurs, it could be as bad or maybe even worse than the last down, the, the, the two, the last down, real estate downturn we saw in, uh, in, uh, 06 through 012, and the stock market crash, I wouldn't be surprised to see the stock market crash another 50%. That's just the way it works. Is so it's, uh, I mean, I'm telling you, and it, what's interesting today is most pe things are happening so fast. Do you remember that the, the, are you old enough to remember back to 1971 when the book um, Future Shock was written by Adam uh, Toffler? Yes. The message of that book, message of that book, Jim, was basically this, the, one of the primary messages. Information is, technology is going to be happening so fast, people aren't going to be able to keep up. And I think to a large degree, that's true today. I don't think most, I don't think most people know what to do. Change is occurring so quickly. And even if they know something's going to happen, even if they can't read the market correctly, I'm not sure that they have the, the ability to act quickly enough to avoid it. These major changes, you know, that, that are occurring nowadays. Don't How do you feel it. about that? Well, uh, one thing I've been told is that changes in real estate happen compared to everything else in the markets. Real estate moves rather slowly, so right. if you start to see things changing, you have a chance for a month or two or maybe three to do something about it. Whereas stocks overnight can, you know, lose. Right, but but even even that that uh, you know, I I agree with your opinion. I think that window may even be uh, um, uh, a little broader than two or three months. But nevertheless. I'm not so sure, I'm not so sure people know what to do anymore. Um, with, with, because it, it's all coming at it, the data's coming at you all the time, uh, much of it, of which it's, it's conflicting, and most people don't know what to do. I think people are kind of like, you know, the, the next downturn, probably like all downturns. People are going to get caught in the headlights like a deer, and just stand there and, you know, let the train run over them. Why do people panic sell their stocks, for example, you know the market, yes, it'll go down, but unless that company goes bankrupt, it's still going to be there. Why not buy more of those shares while they're affordable instead of panic selling and then running away like a scared deer with a loss? Right. The Well, my view is that that occurs at what, you know, when the agony of losing money finally overwhelms you. And that, and that, that degree of agony varies between between a lot of people, differently between people, but not by a wide margin. That's why I think that the buy and hold strategy, even though it sounds good in theory, in practicality, it, 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 it works less often than people think because people get scared. People get scared, Jim. Wouldn't you get scared if you were in the stock market, if you had $500,000 and you were going to retire in 10 years and you said, okay, the stock market makes, you know, it's going to make me 10% a year. And so the next 10 years, I'll have a million bucks. But the wife and I can retire, and we can retire on a million bucks. 
somehow, you know? And all of a sudden that 500,000 turns into 250,000 in, because it's in the stock market. People panic. Isn't that fascinating? I mean, because the thing is, is you should have avoided that, that big loss. You should have avoided that big loss from the start, which is my thesis. I mean, you gotta take the volatility out of this stuff somehow, even if it makes lower long-term returns. At least you, you're not you're not you know manipulated by by fear and by fear and greed all the time, and that's what makes the cycle so damn high. Did you know that 50% of all market moves, whether it's stocks, real estate, bonds, or whatever, are driven by market psychology and not market fundamentals? Would that surprise you? Well, it's the old thing: people are sheep. <sighs> that's right, and so you got to break away from that mentality somehow. You know, following the crowd is fine because the crowd is always right in the middle of trends. Where the wrong is at the end of trends. And that's where it matters most. It's just a fascinating study, Jim. I mean, like, we all, like, I'd like to live to be 120 years old. And I'm working that direction. So, I mean, if I only live to be, you know, 105, are you going to call me a failure? I mean, so I, what I aspire to, my first, and if you believe Warren Buffett, the first rule of money is, is don't lose it. So I'm really, really, and even though I like to make a profit, I think most people, most people would be much better off if they if their defenses were as strong as their offenses. It's like a general. It's like, it's like Sun Tzu. When a general goes to war, does he have a plan to win? Of course he does. If that plan doesn't work, does he have a plan to exit before he loses all his troops? Yes, he does. And most people don't do that in, in the investment market. Why is that, Jim? Why is that? Well, go ahead. Tell us. I don't know. You don't know. Human nature. I mean, are we really that dumb where we can't we can't see danger ahead of time? And, and take action to avoid it in the market is greed. Do we get, do we become so overwhelmed with greed or, or hope that, you know, like, like th this is only going to be a short term correction. I can feel it. <laughs> I, it's just fascinating. So all we can do is try to help each other and, you know, help each other get into rising trends, avoid falling trends and, um, and, and take care of our bodies as good as, as you can. So you live a long, healthy life. Cause what's the point of having a few bucks if you're not healthy? Robert, is one of the problems that they took away the fiduciary duty rule that Obama put in, they never enacted it, where banks actually have to give you good advice instead of advice that just makes them money and forget about you? Um, huh, I wasn't even aware of that, Jim, but that doesn't surprise me at all what you, if, if what you say is true. Because I know, you know, when they had Dodd-Frank, when they had Dodd-Frank, that that bill would, came out to supposedly to put an end to the abuses of the banks. Well, a couple of years ago under Obama, they recently, one of the provisions in that, in, in that uh, Dodd-Frank, I don't know if you're aware of it, was that U.S. banks can never be bailed out again. So if they, if, if they make stupid decisions and lose their money, that's it. They go bankrupt. Two years ago, they repealed that part of, of Dodd-Frank. Yeah, now they that? have bail-ins in Canada and the U.S. where depositors have to bail out the bank. Oh Although, yeah, you're not a depositor anymore. You're a um, you're a client. What do they call it? That the bank's doing you a favor to hold the money on your behalf for your safety. Therefore, it's almost like you're a shareholder. You're you're a shareholder. You're not a depositor. So yeah. technically, they can take uh, like like they did in Cyprus, you know, a certain percentage of your money and just use that uh, depositor money and use that money to bail out the bank. Oh yeah, that's that's on the books in the United States too. It's on the books in Europe. It's Christine on the books Lagarde in Canada. That, law down. It's fact, in... That, that was one of her solutions for solving the the, the European um, the European you know financial crisis that they're in right now. It's confiscate ten percent of all the deposits in every European bank and pay down the debt with it. Well, yeah, the same rule in Canada too. Bail-ins. Wouldn't it be better just if banks are so bad at handling their money to just let them go under? Of course it would, but the banks. You know, the banks are connected to the top. That's where the money is. You know, that's where the, that, that's where all the good old boys are taking care of all the good old boys, the bankers, you know, and the guys making money, Wall Street guys. They're all in it together, Jim. They're not going to do anything that would punish any one of those, you know, individually. So they're all looking out for each other because they're all getting wealthy. What, I just heard a statistic on, on the, on CNBC today, the financial news network. I watch the stocks, you know, the ticker all day. Uh, cause I love the market. And somebody said that, you know, what was it? The, the top, uh, 5% of the, of the wealthiest people in the world own over 50% of all the assets. I mean, that's crazy. That's these guys taking, they're, they're, they're taking care of each other, Jim. So it's not going to happen. 
the banks are always going to get bailed out. Yes, and if the banks are caught dipping into your bank account now and then, as they have been caught, they get a fine that's equivalent to one or two days' worth of profit. Oh, man. I mean, well, who are these banks? I even forget the names. There's been so many abuses. This one big American bank that they were laundering drug money, and they laundered something like like $2 trillion of it and made a profit. They made something like a $2 trillion you know, profit on it, or, or, or 20 billion, or 20 billion or something. Let's say 20 billion. It's not trillion. Profit. And so they, 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 they caught him doing it and they fined him like 500 million bucks. I think it, I think it was HSB, <laughs> right? I think it was HSBC. Right. But that's what they did. So they, you know, in other words, they fined him like 25% of whatever their illegal gain was. Just yeah. taxing illegal gains, I guess. Yeah. That's, that's the bank. That's the world we live in nowadays. Well, in Canada, the the banks contribute the same amount of money to the liberal and conservative parties because they consider either one is shoe in to win, and I would imagine it's probably the same in the U.S. with the yeah, Democrats so. and Republicans. I think so, but, you know, the banks can get away with murder. It doesn't matter if they lose money, and you know this. It's it's obvious, and it's still the game. They're not going to let the banks go down. They won't let them go down. If they go down, I mean, we're in for a really, really big adjustment because. You know that you know credit availability would collapse. Anything that's a, like all all business business depends on credit, of course. You know, even short term or long term credit. A real estate markets depend on credit for sure. You know about you know when somebody buys a home, it's, it's rare that they even put twenty percent down. So a big you know ninety ninety five percent of it is finance dependent on credit. And if that credit all of a sudden wasn't there, wasn't there, or was only available at a high price what, that nobody could afford. Because, you know, interest rates started, you know, doubling or tripling in the next five years. You know what it's going to do to housing prices. So, I mean, those are all possibilities. And uh, they're probably more than possibilities. They're probabilities if you look back in history. I mean, interest rates are at a 500 year or, or in the United States, I, some, I read somewhere they're at a 5,000 year low. You think that's going to hold forever? It, that's just not the way the world works. And, you know, listen to Charlie Munger. Read history. I mean, do, do extreme situations like that last forever? No, not at all. They rebound back the other way. And then, you know, that's where the trend changes. And that's where the opportunity for profit and the opportunity for, for, um, loss exists. So you, so you want to be on the right side of those trends. Uh, getting back to real estate, uh, something that's been mentioned is, uh, since British Columbia brought in a foreign buyer's tax for the greater Vancouver area, people in China somehow are still getting money out of the country. But instead of buying in Vancouver, they're buying in Portland and Seattle. I don't understand that at all. Why wouldn't you? I mean, I don't know why they're doing that. Because Seattle's almost as expensive as San Diego. I mean, Seattle's the highest appreciating major U.S. city uh, in the United States right now. I think it's going up at 13 or 14% a year. I'm from that area. My relatives live in that area. If I had to compare San Diego as a, as a place to live versus Seattle, hands down. It's raining and gloomy up there, you know, 90% of the time. You probably know that. You know Seattle. I mean, I went up there on vacation with my dad, you know, before he passed away a couple of years ago, and we were in that area for two weeks. Guess how many times it was overcast the whole time. Guess how many times we saw Mount Rainier. What time of year? Um, it was in, um, uh, I think it was late summer. Yeah, that'll happen. None. We saw it none. But I mean, how big is Mount Rainier, Jim? Uh, is that a big mountain? Yeah, it is. <laughs> and we were just laughing about it. But Robert, you know, that's in why, Vancouver... That's why we live in California, isn't it, Bob? Yep. Yeah. yeah. Well, Vancouver was very much like California this year. Uh, we had our driest summer ever and also our worst forest fire season ever. Yeah, I mean, you, yeah. you know, you told me about the, the weather in Vancouver, and I yeah. was really surprised at how moderate it is, you know, for, for being that far north. See, but well, we the, still uh, have that big Pacific Ocean that keeps things moderate. You know, not so too I'll, cold, I'll, not I'll too hot. I'll bubble cities in the United States. Yeah. Seattle, Portland, Vegas is in another bubble. Denver's in a bubble. Uh, Dallas is in a bubble. I mean, well, when you have, if you can define bubble saying that they're, they've appreciated way more than they usually do during, um, um, you know, during the boom bust, you know, normal boom bust uh, housing market cycles in the United States. And at the top of, if I had to bet, and I don't know which one to bet on most. I, I think the ones that are most extreme, you know, are probably um, Denver and Dallas. Those are Midwest cities. Those are Midwest cities. Midwest USA housing prices don't move like that. 
They haven't moved like that in the last hundred years, but they're moving like that now. So do I think that's likely to persist? No, I think those are bubbles. So I think, bubbly, I think the next house correction is going to hit those guys um, a lot harder than they think. They're going to get some of this California experience, you know, where housing prices went up, uh, went up, uh, uh, tripled during the, during the 2000 to 2006 boom and then fell 57% during the bust. How much of that stuff you want, Jim? Well, we live in Vancouver. We'll get to see if it works that way as well. You haven't had the, you haven't had a crash like that yet. No, we have not. And I mean, do you think that's possible? Well, anything's possible. One I thing. Mean, well, that- look, if it can happen in California. I mean, California is not like Nigeria or something. I mean, think of it can happen in California. Think it can happen in um, Vancouver. Well, well, one thing is, so we have a huge population influx every year, 23 to 45,000 people, and they okay, all need a place I, I mean, to live. You, you know, I don't know that any place is immune to, any place is immune to, the, yeah. to those kind of, those kind of moves. And I tell, in, in, I, even if the property is exclusive, here in San Diego, I live in a, in a, in a wealthy area around Del Mar. Have you ever heard of Del Mar? Yep. Okay. There's a beachfront there. There's a racetrack. There's a beachfront there. There's, there's, there's 72 homes that sit right, only 72 homes in all Del Mar, Swan Beach sit right on the beach. I mean, we could jump over the seawall and you're in the sand, right? Okay. The, in 2006, those homes, so they're fairly exclusive. I mean, and what, is there any better place to live? I don't think so. If you got the money. So during the 2006, um, at the peak of the market in 2006 in California, those homes were selling for 15 million bucks. And you, you might think that, that that property is so rare and so exclusive that there's no downside to it because some rich guy somewhere has got 15 million bucks and he goes, hey, I can live front row beachfront in Del Mar for 15 million. I'll take it. I'm worth, I'm worth billion. Those, that's not true. Those housing prices fell at, at, at a low point. Um, one of those houses sold for $8 million. $8 million, Jim. It, it fell 45%. That surprised me. That surprised me. And you know what that's done to me? It's, it has created to me that it's not only possible, but it's, I mean, it's that, it, that any place can fall like that regardless of the, of the fundamentals it has going for you. That's why, that's why I'm always nervous about things, Jim. You know, I'm always nervous because that I, I, I believe playing great defense is, you know, wins more championships than playing great offense. I'm kind of like Vince Lombardi. You a football fan? Absolutely. Defense, dude. That's how he won his, even though he had a good offense, he knew the defense, he goes, offense gets the glory. Everybody's, everybody's a genius during the rising market. But when the trend changes, it's defense that brings home the championships. It's true in real estate and it's true in football. Isn't that kind of interesting? Robert, thank you so much for chatting with us. Great. I've enjoyed it too, Jim. Look forward uh, to having another uh, conversation again soon. My guest has been Robert Campbell, publisher of the Campbell Real Estate Timing Letter, his website, realestatetiming.com. And that wraps up our show for this week. We'd like to thank our guests, Ross Clark, Bill Bonner, and Robert Campbell. And thank you for listening. Plus, at the end of the show, in just a few moments, we'll have company showcase updates with American Manganese CEO Larry Ray and Cascadero President Bill McWilliam. If you have any questions for the show, you can email us at info at HowStreet.com. I'm Jim Goddard. We'll be back next week with more This Week in Money. Comments made on This Week in Money are an expression of opinion only and should not be construed in any manner whatsoever as recommendations to buy or sell any financial instrument at any time. Archived online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. This Week in Money is a production of Howe Street Media Incorporated. Executive producer is Tom Allen. Welcome to Company Showcase, an advertising feature on HowStreet.com. I'm Jim Goddard. I'm speaking with Larry Ray, President and CEO of American Manganese. Larry, I imagine, as you always do, you have some good news for us. Well, I've got some great news, uh, Jim. We have uh, finally hit the mainstream uh, and the recycling news. And I know a lot of my uh, investors have been, you know, I guess you might call it... Uh, peaked about why is anybody jumping all over this well i have to tell you that uh when i look at my investors and i think okay you're contrarians you see something that's not 
you know, in the mainstream yet, but you see the potential of it, and you think others should. But they don't necessarily see that until certain events happen. And one of those events is when you, when the, the uh, mainstream news starts to uh, pick you up. You become a, uh, an item of interest, or you, uh, you become somebody that they feel secure in talking about. And that just happened to us about 11 o'clock this morning. Um, Reuters, uh, Thomson Reuters out of London, put out a news article on recycling, and uh, we were one of the ones featured in there. They've uh, got some def- quotes from me and everything else in there. So you, uh, we're finally making the mainstream. That means that uh, people will start to take us more seriously. And that's just the beginning. And, you know, I couldn't be happier that, uh, because sometimes these large uh, news outlets like uh, Bloomberg or Writers will contact you and get some information from you, and then you never hear anything again. But in this particular case, uh, they went ahead and they wrote up the uh, article. And the real point of the whole thing is that now we're not the only ones out there that are beating the drum. It's mainstream commentators that are beating the drum on recycling. How are they beating that drum? Well, they're beginning to recognize that you're not a closed-circuit solution to the environment if you're not doing something with the batteries at the end of the day besides burning them, burying them, and uh, not reclaiming the cathode material because you can, first off, if you reclaim the cathode material, that means the less new mines that have to come on stream. And we can we can uh, reclaim 100% of the cathode material, including lithium, as of uh, prior to filing our uh, our final patent last week. So we're getting into the mainstream. We've been written up in the last two weeks by also another recycling uh, news news outlet out of I think it was out of Oregon, and uh, now out of London. And uh, we've been written up before and, uh, you know, sporadically, but uh, now it's starting to happen. And I think the shareholders can, uh, you know, breathe a, th- breathe a uh, sigh of relief. We're not the only ones out there beating the drum anymore. And uh, I kept a lot of transparency in our company so that people would see that we were progressing, that we actually progressed over a period of a year and a half. And uh, yet everything that we say out there, is only what we gets reported to us from the uh, independent research firm Kometco. So I see this as a huge plus. I mean, uh, Thomson Reuters is uh, read uh, financially worldwide, and for them to uh, mention us, a uh, you know a penny stock company out of uh, out of uh, BC, is big time for us. So. I think that's a heck of a way to close off the week. Uh, certainly, uh, uh, you know, everybody's looking at the stock probably down a half a penny today and wonder why it'd be down a half a penny a day when, uh, when uh, Reuters came out with that article. Well, you got to go back and you have to remember about the predator trading that I wrote up a long time ago so that everybody would be educated on it. And if you look, you'll see that two-thirds of the uh, volume, or more than two-thirds of the volume, was uh, TD. And, uh, you know, it's either a large shareholder getting out who knocks out, knocks out the bids, but that's not the way investors play the market. They usually try to get the best price they can. They don't try to drive the price down. And, uh, yeah, you know, so that to me is predator trading, but... That's going to come to an end. I've been saying that for some time, but it will come to an end. And I can't give you an exact date on it, but uh, I think this is great news for the shareholders of the company. And I congratulate the shareholders that have bought and held and uh, because uh, they're hanging on to a company that's uh, done nothing but progress over the last year and a half. And Larry, uh, just newly announced as well, rolled out today, Tesla has now got a, a semi-trailer tractor that's battery-operated. Can you imagine the amount of lithium and cobalt you would recover from a large vehicle like that? 
Well, this is all a big plus for us. Uh, you know, we're still focusing on the EV batteries, but what ha- what that does is it sucks up the supply a little more. You know, and uh, people don't even realize that mining industry has uh, battery operated trucks up to three, four hundred tons, and uh, those are huge batteries too. So, and the and the maritime industry is has got uh, huge batteries uh, to power ships. So, you know, as we talk about the EV market because that's where the focus is and, uh, you know, that's the type of battery we're going after. But the supply of uh, batteries is going to require a huge supply of cathode materials, and that includes lithium and cobalt, which is in short supply. Larry, for new listeners, can you explain what exactly American Manganese does? American Manganese is a specialty mining uh, explorationist, and we have uh, holdings in uh, manganese and cobalt and gold and uh, rare earths. We uh, also have a technology for taking very low grades of uh, manganese and economically producing the metals and the dioxides from the, those manganese deposits at comparative prices to what it costs in China that are that are produced that are producing from 40 to 50 percent ores we're talking two to three percent ores that technology um, thankfully also works on the chemistries in the cathode battery so over 60 years of history in the development of our te- technology and at least 10 years with us the uh, We've reached a point now where we can uh, reclaim 100% or recycle 100% of the cathode materials, which is going to reduce the amount of digging that's going to have to be done to get uh, battery materials. And it's going to become very prominent. If you start looking at the uh, million uh, million batteries going to 5 million and 225, and those numbers out there, they may be, op- they may be uh, optimistic or they may be conservative. We don't know. It doesn't matter. It's uh, There's a lot of batteries that uh, will be displayed to anybody that's in the recycling business. And just to close up, I'd like to say that uh, you can find out any details on us at AmericanManganeseInc.com. And we are traded on the Venture Exchange under the symbol AMY.T and on the U.S. Exchange under the single symbol AMYZF, and then Frankfurt under the symbol 2M. And how can people find out more information about American manganese? Well, they can go to the site, which I previously mentioned, or they can uh, email me at lray at amy.com, and that's l-r-e-a-u-g-h at amymn.com. Or they can phone the office here and ask for me at 778 778- Five seven four 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 four. Larry, thanks for the update. You're welcome, Jim. My guest has been Larry Ray, CEO and President of American Manganese. I'm Jim Goddard. We were speaking on November 17th. Comments made on Company Showcase are an expression of opinion only and should not be construed in any manner whatsoever as recommendations to buy or sell any financial instrument at any time. Archived online at HowStreet.com. Company Showcase is a production of How Street Media Incorporated. Welcome to Company Showcase, an advertising feature on HowStreet.com. I'm Jim Goddard. I'm speaking with Cascadero Chairman Bill McWilliam. Welcome back to the show, Bill. Thanks very much, Jim, uh, Jim and thanks for the opportunity again. So what is coming out that's new with Cascadero? Well, we're uh, summarizing our program for the year at this point, and we're still working on one property. But um, things are things are difficult in the assay business right now because the assay labs are, especially in Argentina, are plugged with lithium samples, and it's very hard to get uh, a turnaround time from an assay company, if not impossible. And some of them are not even accepting rush orders, so that's causing delays. And uh, the problem with uh, being in a small company right now and being the uh, chairman is that uh, these things are, uh, I have to be accountable for, for problems and delays that 
we did not cause, right? And there's a lot of companies in this particular position. We put out a news release this morning on Cerita Este, our Argentine gold prospect that uh, is developing beautifully. And we handed uh, 600, and th- I think it was 607 samples, uh, Sea Horizon soil samples to the lab and about another 160 rock samples. And they couldn't give us a date, a turnaround date. So it's, it's really bad in Argentina because of the lithium Lithium business is totally crazy down there. The, it's everyone is uh, into the lithium, trying to get into or is in the lithium business, and a lot of the equipment is tied up drilling in Solars. We're probably the only or one of the very few uh, exploration companies that actually are dealing in uh, hard rock situations. The rest of the activity, and there's a shortage of drill rigs now, is all focused on lithium. This was. This looks to me like it's going to last for a bit. So um, we just have to put up with it and uh, accept a delay. And uh, it's it's very frustrating because we're waiting for these assays on Street S to to plan our next program. And the purpose of the samples that we're doing is to figure out the orientation, the strike of the sheeted veins and vein arrays that exist on the property that run gold. Because it's important to know that before you trench it, and the trench gives you trenching gives you more information with respect to the orientation. And the reason we're doing that, taking our time to do this, is because we want the drill hole, when located, to penetrate the vein system at basically a perpendic- 90 degree angle perpendicular. So we get a feel for the distribution, continuity, and the uh, uh, the strike of the of the of the system itself. A little frustrating. We've got to just put up with it. The news release today does not have any new assay da- data in it, but the most important <coughs> uh, the most important piece of data that's in there, and uh, people should focus on this and understand what this means, because the percentage of our samples uh, on this property, we've taken 128 rock chip rock samples, and uh, 87. Uh, sorry. Uh, what have I got here? 87 of them are over one gram. So that's the 68% of the samples are over um, one gram. <clears throat> that's an interesting threshold because most open pit type deposits, uh, 70% of the assays are under one gram. And we've also got 10, uh, 28% of our samples, 36 of the 128. But they're over 10 grams per ton. So those numbers are excellent uh, in terms of surface work, and we're very excited about getting a little, some subsurface information from the trenching. I do not think we're going to be able to get a drill hole in this before Christmas, but it'll be first up on our on our plate in February. So that's uh, it, we've moved it along. We're very excited about the property. It does have an excellent chance. This zone right now is 1,200 meters north-south and 400 meters east-west. It's clearly structurally controlled, and the system is uh, very, very prospective for a, a gold deposit. So we will finish the program coming up December 5th, and our geologists and crew will be ready, getting ready for Christmas. They'll all come back to Vancouver. And we'll plan, have a planning meeting, of course, as we usually do. Uh, I'm heading down on the 7th of December for my last trip to get some property issues that we're trying to, we're trying to acquire a couple of properties that are taking a little bit more time than I expected. So going down to do that primarily and add to our portfolio of, of quality assets. Okay, so the, the information on Tehran, and this has been a subject of some debate on the internet and the, the bull boards is that the the property is a bust, as I've said before. It is not a bust. It's a very robust system, and we're going to spend some more time and money on it to improve the size of it and hopefully improve the grade somewhat. And again, that won't happen until 2018. That's number two on our plan. But uh, the facts are, in this business, because of the cesium supply issue, as there is no new supply coming into the market, 
Cesium prices, especially at the contract level, are rising 15% every six months or so. So in reality, the cesium property and the, and the amount of cesium we have in, in that property is rising in value by the day. So we're not spending any money in it right now. We will in the, in the new year, but the property is getting more and more valuable as the expectations of a supply shortage are shortening, and uh, it's going to happen. We've predicted this for a while, that there's no new supply coming on. Toronto is the only property that is identified as cesium resource, and uh, it's a very, very good news all around. Bill, for people not familiar with the Cascadero story, can you tell us a bit more about the company? We have we're, we started as a property generator, Jim, which means that uh, we went to Argentina because the properties were large scale. The alteration systems were were big. A uh, property, a junior company, could get a large land position at virtually no cost. So the business plan was focused on just that: surface exploration. It's all geochemistry. We did a little bit of geophysics, but mainly geochemistry. And we acquired, we looked at about 130 properties. We acquired 76 tenements. And the portfolio we have today, that was about 200,000 hectares of, of uh, mineral properties we owned, or had rights to, I should say, ex exploration rights to. And uh, it is now down to 47,000 hectares and 27 tenements. So what we have today is a rendering of that very large land position into all of the core projects that we now have. We have four areas that we call core. One of them is Tehran, of course. Uh, the Takataka -taka block of land we own beside First Quantum. Lots of readers in that group. There's several other showings and interesting deposits in that area, showings in that area. And that is our second uh, priority target. Santa Rosa is a few hundred kilometers uh, east of Tehran and um, Sarita Este. It's our number three um, core system. It's a large scale seven kilometer long uh, vein system that's uh, very rich in gold, silver, and lead. And we'll be spending money on that next year as well. So we're, we're in really good shape here, Jim, in terms of uh, getting good results from a a large set of properties that's now much smaller and much more focused. And it, there's, uh, there's gold present in basically every one of the tenements in various degrees, right? But so it's a, a very interesting precious metal portfolio right now. Where is Cascadero traded? It trades on the Toronto Stock Exchange Venture Board. The symbol is uh, CCD. And it trades right now between seven and eight cents. We have uh, 191 million shares outstanding, so it's still got a relatively cheap uh, market cap. And we believe, I believe, and I have believed in this company for a long time, that its uh, portfolio is more than robust enough to support the market cap and make the market cap increase significantly. We're in a very good spot here. And we can exp we're expecting to have an exploration drill hole into this in one or two of these properties next year, and the whole flavor of the company is going to change. Bill, where can people find out more about Cascadero? We've just revamped our website, cascadero.com, and you'll see uh, the opening picture is the the Tehran property, and it's about it's got a bunch of uh, looks like mole hills on it. Well, those are that's a uh, Material from the trenches that are being dug. In the background, there's the giant uh, stratovolcano called El Cavar. <clears throat> Sorry, um, yeah, Nevada de Cavar. And it's a large uh, engine for mineral systems, and it provides a lot of, uh, a lot, it's still an active volcano. It's provided a lot of material for mineral systems, oh, for, I don't know, 100 kilometers or so. It's a real powerhouse system. Underexplored, we have one standalone property called Campo Viejo on the uh, northern side, southern side of the of the uh, volcano, <clears throat> and uh, we are, have just uh, uh, entered into a confidentiality agreement on that property. It's big, it's got scale, and the CA is with a major company because they understand 
the systems, this is a big porphyry system, and it's got uh, very good upside. So we're we're happy about that. Having that property under the the wings uh, of a of a big of a major company is, is is a real achievement for a junior company, and we're proud to be you know have that happen. Bill, thanks for the update. Okay, Jim, we're all excited here, and uh, we're looking forward to Christmas time. And everybody, have a great Christmas. Take it easy, relax, and uh, have some fun. I've been speaking with Cascadero Chairman Bill McWilliam. I'm Jim Goddard. We were speaking on November 15th. Comments made on Company Showcase are an expression of opinion only and should not be construed in any manner whatsoever as recommendations to buy or sell any financial instrument at any time. Archived online at HowStreet.com. Company Showcase is a production of How Street Media Incorporated.